terms of pure rhetoric, was Churchill. And Churchill, of course, others abide our question, thou art free, as uh, Matthew Arnold said of Shakespeare. He is the one that everybody naturally would point to in, in terms of English rhetoric, in the way that we would point to Martin Luther King and now Obama in terms of American. And their differences are quite revealing, aren't they? There is a tradition in America, which is partly to do with the first wave of immigrants, I think. It's a homiletic tradition, a, a tradition of sermonizing, a tradition of, uh, of, uh, um, of the pulpit. Um, and it's a low church tradition, and it's one which uses the, all, the, all the techniques of the great preacher to awaken you know, the rhythms, I have a dream, and so on. And in Churchill, it's a rather more classical, although he famously um, failed in his, you know, Harrovian uh, uh, entrance exam, but was passed through because his father was Lord Randolph, um, and although he never went to university, you, I mean, think of, he wants to say, go Britain, all right? You want to say, go England during the war. You want to say, yay, you know, you'd, you'd say, um, you'd say, en avant, how, how would you say it in any language? He dared to say, <laughs> in the 1940s, at a time when it was already unbelievably old-fashioned, advance Britannia. I mean, how does that... Does that still send the chills up? Yeah, the, I mean, yes, it does. But one of the extraordinary things about Churchill is that the, the, the speeches that we now know by mm. heart were all made in the House of Commons. They were yeah. political arguments in the most exacting chamber. Yes. So far what we heard from Obama, and I thought, I thought his, 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 um, his speech in January was extraordinary because mm. the, the selling, yes. the campaigning, was heroic and spectacular. It was inspiring, and you did. It, it was, mm. go Obama, you're quite right. But mm. the, the, mo the inauguration speech almost deliberately refused rhetoric. It was very noticeable that. Yeah, and it? he took yeah. the third clause yeah. down, he yeah. ended on a negative, yeah. and... It was as if he was saying, now this is different, this yeah. is business. No cheap fireworks here. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and he has since had to do more studied speeches, like the one at Notre Dame, or yeah. where he speaks to students, and there he does, again, sort of, you know, like the, like the touch paper. And I assume that the, um, the test will be, when he is putting forward great policy, how he addresses the nation, and also in that intimate way that we've come to expect of American presidents, the, the breakfast briefing when he talks... Yeah from the White House desk, where he can't bring out the fireworks. He has to do it as close as this. Yeah. And sometimes, of course, what you, you should, the last thing you want to do is, as it were, ex, you know, like, it's like parents who say, oh, no, do, don't get the children excited. They, they, they need to go down to bedtime, you know. So mm -hmm. if you're going to read them a story, read them a very dull story very quietly. I know this as an <laughs> uncle. If you start playing games with them and pulling faces and doing these things, you're getting them all hot and excited. They won't sleep for two hours. And I'm not saying, well, maybe I am saying that politicians treat the, their, their, their public as children. But you want to get them excited for an election, but then there are long periods in which you don't want them excited. You don't want to innovate the, the spirits no. of the and people. reduce you expectations. Just, exactly, reduce expectations and keep it calm. And all the great speeches we know are always a result of a crisis of some kind. You know, there's the Roosevelt speech about uh, this day will live in infamy. It was, you know, the day after Pearl Harbor. And uh, obviously Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream was, a, was, 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 was a, uh, bringing to a climactic pitch the, that the whole issue of civil rights in America and Churchill, of course, was against. We don't remember many of his speeches uh, outside the, 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 his premiership, his first premiership during the war. No, in fact, the very first speech he, he made, his maiden speech, was, was astonishing because it was, uh, um, it was controversial, which is against the spirit of the House. You mentioned um, a minute ago the idea that we all secretly love America or want to love America. Yes, yeah. And I, I'm assuming that even in terms of language, the America that we love, as you say, is, is Capra, it's, it's Billy Wilder, it's the most successful imperialist tool ever designed, which is Hollywood and rock and roll combined. Yes. So I'm fascinated by the point at which you, the absolutely quintessential English-educated man, fell in love with the idea of American popular culture. Mm. I wonder about that too. I mean, I wonder about all... I mean, I, I think it really is. I don't know if any, any of you have ever inspected why it is you like what you like. Um, part of me is a, 
is a vulgarian, and I will absolutely admit that much of American culture is the vulgarization of the sophisticated European culture. You talk about Billy Wilder. Well, Billy Wilder comes out of a tradition, the tradition that invented cinema, the tradition of, of, of Murgau and Pabst and Lang and, 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 Aus and Offels and, and Austrian and German expressionism, and the very beginning of cinema, which was an amazingly artistic, it was connected to the, to, the, to the plastic arts of the time, the sculpture and the, and the painting and the literature uh, of Germany and, 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 and the great actors of the day and were, were German until unfortunately some idiot invented sand and then suddenly Conrad Veidt <laughs> could no longer be a romantic hero to the English speaking people and ditto, ditto Peter Laura and, and, and all the others. And they came over and they realized the American public wanted, uh, they wanted a good story, well told. They wanted something romantic. They wanted something comically clever but that satisfied you at the end, that, that sort of provided. And, um, and a part of me loves that. But the point is, it's not either or. You don't either like Billy Wilder and Walt Disney or Wagner and Goethe. You can like both. The two are not mutually incompatible by any means. They don't, one doesn't rule out the other. But I, personally, I'm, I mean, you played the, I noticed the play on music. It was a lot of swinging, a lot of Frank Sinatra. Um, I mean, it's just fantastic that America can, rather than, although there are great American classical composers, that rather than, rather than try and take on, you know, Brahms and Mahler and Richard Strauss and, 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 uh, uh, Berg and the composers at the same time. There was Irving Berlin was rising up and writing popular songs that, um, that I would argue were as important as Wojciech or or as important as you know Till Eulenspiegel or whatever else was being written in the classical sphere. One one of the cleverest things about about lyrics which you just introduced is the great thing that is preposterously cited against America, that they have no sense of irony. The, the, the beauty of those great lyricists is yeah. that they were using words and music in a way that invited you to challenge the authenticity of every phrase. Yes, exactly. I mean, if you take Lorenz Hart and Cole Porter, say, two of probably the two finest lyricists of the 20th century, um, that their irony is apparent in every phrase. It is, uh, only it's a really subtle irony, mostly... When British people say Americans don't get Ari, they're saying Americans don't get sarcasm. Well, yes, Americans get sarcasm, I think. They understand if it's raining and an Englishman says, nice day, they know that the Englishman is trying to be funny. And failing! <laughs> and failing dramatically! What is more pathetic? What is it, how does C.S. Lewis put it in the, in the Narnia book? Saying the thing which is not. It is, I mean, it's feeble. If that's one's idea of irony, it's just crass sarcasm. And Americans also think, okay, and do you have to do it all the time? <laughs> can, can you, like, stop? <laughs> you know. do, you, do you know that A.C. Grayling, um, um, Richard Who? Holmes tells the most wonderful story based in Hay on Why about the It's Raining gag. Oh, no. And he's stopped by a man as he's going into, into a tent to speak. And this man says, oh, Mr. Holmes, it's raining today. Marvellous weather for biographers. And Richard looks at him and says, what? He says, plenty of feet of clay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very good. You see that? You see that? Genuine wit. I like um, that. <laughs> the idea that 